What's up, guys, and welcome to the Ted Jones World Podcast. We've got another virtual episode with my former tennis coach, living at the 45, Brody Tennis, and co-host of The Real Spin with myself. Jack Brody on the podcast. Jack, say what up, man. Give us hey, a what up? Everything happens at the 45, man. So, Jack, you and I have recently taken on a project. Uh, you called me probably like four or five months ago. You were like, why don't we start a live stream tennis podcast type where we have legends who have won grand slams before on the pod talking the tennis shit and uh just this project that we've been doing over the last four or five months so let's talk about it man well how did you how'd you get the idea and just talk about your tennis background in general well you know i just you know with all the pickleball noise and stuff these days and and, uh, you know, tennis has sort of been taking a back burner and break point tried to do something. I don't know if it's taken much of an effect, but, you know, I'm talking to my wife who doesn't play tennis, never did. She's a cowgirl from Wyoming. Right. And she, uh, you know, and I said to her, you know, what is it with tennis? How come you never got into it? She goes, and she never watches matches with me. And I, I can understand that uh, if you're not a player. And I, I said, what is it about tennis? She goes, there's nothing fun about tennis. It's just for, if you're an outsider, you're way outside. You know, she said, I can watch football games, even basketball games, uh, you know. And she said, uh, you know, it's it's just not that much fun for an outsider to watch a tennis match. Cause, I you would know, agree. You're... I think because when you're watching yeah. other sports, you can see the athleticism and you know the end goal. In tennis, it's a little bit confusing with the scoring and how the point starts. I think that's intimidating for a lot of people when they watch tennis. And then even playing tennis, it's a whole different ball game. We talk all the time about how vulnerable you are every single time you go on the tennis court. It's just, and I think a big part of it is the way it's presented. You know, these tennis players are like shown as gods and 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 the camera's always way above, you know, every once in a while they'll get down on the court, but very rarely, I think guys like Nick Kyrgios make the game a little more enjoyable. My wife actually liked watching him. She liked watching Federer. There were certain people she liked to watch, but in general, couldn't get her to watch it. And then one night we're watching uh, watching a TV show uh, on, on cable news called Gutfeld, which is a very popular show. And uh, and it, it's just funny as hell. We won't miss it. It's it's really the guy's funny, and and all of his guests are comedians like yourself. And I just said to my wife, I said, you know, I wish tennis had something like this. And then I went ding ding ding, and I said, I know T Money Jones. And then you called your boy Ted Jones. I, I called my boy and said, what do you think? And you had to think about it for about twenty four hours. Uh, you know, being the, you know, the entrepreneur that you are. And um, you hit me back up the next day and said, let's do it. So uh, it basically started off as a knockoff of that show, you know, via tennis. You know, I, I do the silly poems. I try to I try to be real. I try to cut up. You know what I mean? But I, I was trying to just bring tennis down to a level where everyone can appreciate it, whether you're talking to the Roscoe Tanners and Johan Creeks, you know, the the gods of tennis, you know, guys that have won grand slams or whether you're talking to guys like we did this past week, you know, guys that are grinding on the tour that, that can barely, you know, break into the top few hundred. And uh, it's not an easy battle for those guys. And then everyone in between, right? We did some on women's tennis and I don't know. And, and for me, it was all about, you know, uh, being fun and funny and entertaining and informative because I think that's the problem when you watch tennis on TV. It's none of those three things. There's it, not really, really not. yeah, there's a lack of behind the scenes in tennis. You know, like even the post-match interviews, it's kind of like you'll do the 30 second on court interview, but then that's really the end of you hear from that person until the next time they're on the court, you know, the coverage of basketball, football and baseball in America is all over the TV. It's plastered. But when you look to a network like tennis channel, they are not, they're a subscription service, right? So it's difficult for people to even have access to that particular tournament, unless it's a grand slam on ESPN. Right. If it's a slam, it's on ESPN and sometimes, you know, uh, NBC, but uh, in general, um, e even the commentators are dry as friggin' toast. I mean, I can't stand it personally. And, and for a lot of my friends, I speak for them. 
uh, tennis friends, we turn off the sound. I mean, it's, you know, they're not particularly bright. They're certainly not that funny. And they can't even really relate to this game. I mean, it's mostly old folks that talk about, you know, oh, you know, they just want to be able to say rack it back early. And you can't do that with these guys today. A guy like Kyrgios, you know, he just he he cracks the ball like, like his racket's a bullwhip. And, um, you know, me being in the trenches and, and worked with some great players, I think I know the game better. And I've met all I've met most of these guys, you know, uh, Shriver, Gilbert. I've met most of them. And, yeah, I, I think we have I have a better take on it than they do, period. What so do you, what do you think the. So I, I call it the real spin, man. You know, the other day we heard some funny stories, right, with uh, with Javier and, and Mark Kyle, the guy who beat Sampras and, uh, you know, in, in a tournament in Africa and. And these guys, you know, they grinded to qualify for Wimbledon. Yeah. And it's really it's really fascinating to hear that story because it's not a glamorized story, you know. And you, I think everyone can relate to that, you know, whether you're grinding to be a comedian, right? Or, you know, on tour, on the comedy tour, or whether you're grinding to get to the top of your profession, whatever it is. It's super uh, fascinating to think about sports, you know, because if somebody is 200 in the world, in basically every sport, they're signed to a contract that will guarantee them X amount of money for what, whether it's a year or maybe it's a five-year contract. In tennis, when you're at the 200 level, a guy like Mark Kyle, you really see that these guys are grinding week to week and they don't know what their paycheck's going to be like in two weeks. So tennis is just a little bit a little bit more of a grueling process if you're not making those Grand Slam tournaments where you automatically get $50,000 if you lose in the first round. These individual sports are a whole different thing. I guess it's more like prize fighting. You don't hear about the guys grinding it out, you know, that aren't winning, uh, you know, the heavyweight champion of the world, you know, it's just in a gym somewhere in Philadelphia. Why do you think uh, that, why do you think that golf, uh, well, Jack, why do you think that golf has more coverage and more fans than tennis? Well, I can tell you it didn't back in the 70s. In the 70s, it was all tennis because you had all the celebrities, Farrah Fawcett, Vinnie Van Patten. You had all these celebrity, pro-celebrity tournaments, and it was a sexy sport. And golf was the second secondary sport back then. I think Tiger Woods made a big difference. Right. Um, I, I really do. But yeah, and, I, and I, I think they do a better job. I think they do a better job uh, analyzing and uh, the swing and all that to help uh, routine, you know, weekend warriors uh, with their golf game. And I don't I think, think the tennis, really... I don't think tennis does that. We used yeah. to have Vic Braden, who wasn't the greatest, God rest his soul. He was a great guy, but you know, he, at least he was jovial and he got people into the game and, and he would come in the middle of a, of a, you know, of a tournament on TV and he'd go, Hey, did you see him miss that backhand? Here's why. It gave you something, but well, that also like, feels no like there's, there's today. passion behind his words. You know, like anybody who watches golf really loves to play golf. When you can't really maybe say the same about tennis, it's when you think about the announcers, you don't think of Chris Fowler being a guy who's out on the court every week. But when a guy's announcing a golf match or a tournament, that guy's out there a few times a week on the course, learning more about golf. When the personalities in tennis, it's not really, it's not really former pros or people who love the game. And I think that's something that's lacking in the sport. Well, you know, I never really thought about that exactly, but I, I think you're onto something there. I think the guys like Fowler and they got a couple of ladies now that are, you can tell are not players. Uh, they don't know the game well enough, so they don't really do much for you. And then the ex players that they have on, well, they were grinding so hard and working out so hard. They don't have the personality. They don't have the wit. They don't have the humor. And also, no uh, offense. So to their, really, no good no commentators at all. Yeah, no offense to their age, but these guys, a lot of these guys, retired over thirty plus years ago. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you yeah. don't have that. The game has changed so much since then. You talk about guys like Nick Kyrgios who are not swinging with just their arm. The guys hitting underhand serves. So. Why don't we talk to somebody who's 250 in the world last year and they're debating their pro career, but now they have a guaranteed paycheck from ABC for the, for the quarter or whatever it is, the grand slam. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you on that one. Not to mention the fact that, 
you know, these guys will reference a match back from the 70s. Who gives a shit? Really? <laughs> I mean, even I, I used to love the tennis back then. I don't even care. I don't even care because the matches that I used to watch, you know, Borg and Connors, you can't put that up against a Nadal Fed or a Djokovic, uh, you know, Kyrgios match. Well, you you, you just be, can't. Would you be interested in hearing two rivals in the booth, like guys like Jimmy Connors and John McEnroe in the same booth? Would that be something that will bring in more tennis fans, the rivalry type? It's not a bad idea. You mean almost like the Manning brothers doing the football now? Yeah. Because I do enjoy that. I have to say, having the two brothers that were rivals – doing the commentary now on Monday nights. I, I think that was a really great addition. You see what's happening with baseball. They're going through a kind of a whole transformation change where games are going from, they were averaging three hours and 10 minutes last year. And now they're all the way down to two hours and 40 minutes, just in the beginning of the season by changing the pitch clock. Guys can't come out of the batter's box. They have so many new rules that speed up the game and make it more audience and user friendly. And I think that, Tennis really does need a bump in the bump in the game. You know, ever since pickleball came out, it's so simple to play pickleball. It's easy to watch. Everybody can play it. I think these these scoring systems are draconian and old. We got to mix something up. It's that playing till twenty one nineteen in the fifth set. I don't think is attractive to us younger people who are immediately going to change the TikTok if it's not funny in the first five tenths of a second. You know what I mean? We we well, need something to yeah. you know, change it up. Well, I, I think tennis prides itself a little bit on being traditional. Right. But and I, has, I don't think that's been working since the Sampras and Agassi days or since Roddick well, won the last Grand Slam. That was kind of the last time U.S. was really watching tennis. And yes, obviously the Venus and Serena years that they were together and playing but i i don't know i, ju I just think it's been well it's really you're hard. talking slams you're talking slams because they have been doing it in the lower level tournaments right they're doing super breakers uh they're you know they're not allowing the third set to go you know more than six all that's I it you know that, i think that this is good i think speeding up tennis a little bit is going to make it more interesting there's no reason that guy should be on the court for five hours <laughs> yeah i, I mean and certainly the women's talk about, you know, oh, equal pay and all that. I feel like everybody should be playing two out of three sets. Win by two in the third set. That's fun. Yeah, I, I would go for that. The problem is, you know, tennis is such a sport where some of it's just really massive endurance, you know. And, and the true diehards just love to watch Nadal just grind it out for five hours. I mean. Is he going to take the but, French, bro? He's a little hurt. But, like, it's crazy. This happens every year. Is Nadal going to win year. the French? Is he going to win the French? I don't think so. I don't think so. Let's come back to this episode in two months. I should have put 10 grand on Nadal. I tell you that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tell you, this year, I don't think so. <laughs> but how many times have you said that, right? <laughs> I said it last year, too. I said it last year, too. Well, no, he's but not, I don't think playing, so. Yeah, he's not playing Madrid. I think he had like a little bit of a knee issue, but that's usually been him holding in his holding in his energy for the bigger tournaments. It, I'm, I'm happy to see Roger doing big business moves, and we need him to be a bigger ambassador for the sport. I don't know what that entails right now. And I know he's only been out of the game for nine months, Jack, but with his sponsorships with on the running shoe Rolex, I want to see him in the booth, bro. It's not like yeah, everybody wants really... to see Federer in the booth, but I think he's just too suave to be sitting there with James Blake. When James Blake was like, Oh, that was a rocket there. That'd be like, look at the way he moves on his ballerina toes. What? Something like that. Yeah. He's on the doll yeah. and Fed in the booth, bro. That's fun. It seems like the guys that really were iconic, like um, Agassi and Sampras, they want nothing to do with it. It, it was more, you Sampras know, the was, secondary Sampras players. Was, Sampras was never a media person, ever. I think no. Agassi, Agassi had a hint of flair in the media. You know, he's dating actresses and stuff like that. But nowadays, these tennis guys, they're kind of, they're, they're kind of, they kind of keep to themselves. You know, they'll have that girlfriend since age 16. They end up marrying them and that's kind of the end of their social existence. You know, we don't really see tennis players out on the town. You don't hear controversial stories about tennis players just because they don't really have teammates to distract them. And anyone who is on their team better be adding to the fire, JB, and not deflating the fire, 
putting air on the fire, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's gotten a lot more serious because we heard this week from those guys when it's not serious and they're just drinking too much. And what was Javier telling us about banging that girl who was seven yeah. years older than him? And, yeah. you know, and he was like, you know, oh, man, I got a match tomorrow. Eh, fuck it. I, I want to bang this girl. I mean, you know, I think the guys at the top now are so serious that you don't hear any stories. You used to. I mean, Borg has plenty of stories. And a lot of these guys used to hang out in Monte Carlo and, and party and all that stuff. But no, tennis has gotten very big business now. The fitness so, has gone up. The age of retirement is going up. I was yep. talking, We were talking with Mark Kyle the other night about how Andy Roddick was kind of the last superstar to retire at a 30 years old, you know, like if maybe even younger. Around, yeah. Yeah. If he was around now, I, I mean, I don't know how his body would hold up, but it'd be, he'd be considered young. People would have been like, well, he's not playing until 33, 34. And fed was out there until God knows how old he was. 40, so 40, yeah. 40. And I think these younger guys are going to be around for a long time. We're going to see Alcaraz. I don't know if he's going to beat Djokovic or Nadal slam or Feder Cause that's a ridiculous amount of slams, but you can already tell that the kid's going to win double digit grand slams. That's almost a guarantee. You can kind of say it at this point. Yeah, I, I think so. I think it's going to go back to the seventies where guys are trading slams. I would, I would say that too. Also, it's going to look more like the women's game, but I mean, the women's game over the past 10 years has been crazy. There've been a hundred slam winners. I don't think it'll be that dramatic, but I do see the guys like Alcaraz, Sinner, Rublev, Kachanov, those kind of guys, maybe American in there, Fritz, Tommy Paul, start yep. to win Grand Slams over the next three years when uh, Djokovic kind of falls away. But he always has been in the quiet, in the quiet crowd. And I think that's been that's been his whole career. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, he was kind of a humorous guy. I remember he'd go out there and he'd imitate Sharapova and he'd imitate uh, Nadal and everybody. Yeah, picking and that his was butt. him. That was him less serious. And you talk about tennis players becoming more serious. People don't even remember that part of Djokovic. And I don't even think people remember the 20 ball bounces either that was kind of in that same area when he used to when he used to do that same era well yeah i think he still does that for the most part i think but he still it's, does but it, it but it doesn't make itself onto sports center with how many bounces he's doing you know what i mean yeah yeah i i think we've had a couple big losses that have not helped the tennis i mean like i said Kyrios has helped but i think losing federer you've lost a lot of fans i think, del, I think losing del, del potro serena I mean, the thing, when you ask me who's going to win this women's tournament, I feel like that emoji, you know, that, you know, yeah, wait, that's, wait, that's wait, how wait, that's I feel. Thumb. Can we do that? I want to do that for the thumb. Do that again. <laughs> All right. There we go. No, I mean, so, you know, I don't know. It's um, like I said, the real spin is the real spin. And that's, that's what I really wanted with it. I wanted people to see, oh, tennis can be really funny. And it can be fun and entertaining and humorous, you know, from the locker room to the practice court to crazy, crazy tournaments. I mean, I've held back, to be honest with you, on some of my matches in college uh, because, you know, I, I still, uh, I don't know, I still teach a bunch of kids and <laughs> I have a reputation. But tennis is crazy, but people don't see it that way. People like my wife just think it's prim and proper and quiet and it's just, it's it's none of those things, uh, not when you really see it. I think they try to hide the bad behavior, actually. And, and and you know, back in the 80s when Mac was playing, they just let it, they let it fly. They let him yeah, go. I, and I, I, want, I wonder why, because you think about sports now, you think about the NHL, when you go to games, you want the guys on the ice to fight. It's just, it brings in the viewers more. So I think guys like Curios are great for the sport, even though sometimes it's unbearable to watch his behavior. We need more. We need more action. We need more live, live entertainment that brings tennis to the forefront. Things. That yeah, I mean, why, you watch the other sports. You know, when people go to a car race, I mean, they go to see a crash. When they go to a hockey game, they go to see a fight. You know. Uh, yeah, you want to see a meltdown. You want to see that guy. I can't remember who it was the other week. This guy broke six rackets. I think it was like Herbert Herzkak broke no joke six rackets. Yeah, I think I saw that that video as well. But uh, yeah, no, I'm not sure what's going to save the game. But I mean, certainly that's one reason I'm here. You know, that's one reason I do the real spin and living at the 45 
is because I want to bring more people into the game because it's an unbelievable game. I mean, it, it really can give you a life. I mean, look, you're still, even though you're doing something completely different now, tennis somehow managed to stay in your life and it probably will to the day you die. So I, I really think people don't understand what tennis can do for people uh, as far as everything from, you know, stick to to discipline, to improvement and, you know, never quitting. I, I just think um, tennis is such a great avenue and it, unlike pickleball, it's not an easy entry. You know, pickleball, I always say the same thing. Pickleball is for quitters. You know, if you don't want to put your heart on the line, Hey, pickleball. I mean, I, I could see myself doing it when I got very frustrated at tennis. If pickleball was around, I'd probably go, screw this. I'm going to go play pickleball where my natural talents will be appreciated and I don't have to choke. There's no choking in pickleball. But tennis, I think that's the biggest factor in tennis is the choke factor. I know you hate it when people ask, what's a quick tip that you can give me? Just because the word tip is used so many different times in tennis. What would you say is a quick lesson for somebody to enjoy the game of tennis more? What's something simple that they can follow? I'm glad you asked that uh, because you know I don't give tips. And I think that's one of the things that's really been holding the game back. People trying to, you know, the pro usually says something like, try this. Well, I'm like, wait a second. What do you mean try this? It's either right or wrong. You either know what you're talking about or you don't. Tennis, I, I say the tip would be get an education. You know, understand why the 45 is where you want to line up. Understand why that's where all the great players line up to. Understand that it's not the arm that that moves the racket to hit the ball. It's the dog that wags the tail. You know, it's the core that moves the arm that moves the racket. And, and you know, uh, have an education and don't just try tips because, uh, I mean, just think about it. It's just the tip of the iceberg. You're not really learning anything. So I say go down beneath and see, you know, see what forms the iceberg. What would you stress more, though, the figure eight or the 45 degree angle? If you can explain the figure eight. Well, I mean, they actually have a lot to do with one another. I mean, if you if you uh, if you show the you know the vertical and the horizontal, you know, the figure eight fits very nicely in there, and the forty five bisects the figure eight perfectly. So it really all just fits when you watch a skier come down a, a mountain. He comes and he he does an S curve. Well, that's a figure eight, but it's also the forty five, right? Because the S is going towards the forty five. Uh, you know, when you watch a Kobe Bryant or, you know, a great basketball player at the free throw, they line up at the 45 and then they use their body in a way where it's beautiful. They don't just chunk it up like Shaq used to do and drive me friggin' crazy because he couldn't as hit well. a free throw. Pitchers in baseball as well, releasing at the 45? Sure. You release the pitch at the 45. If you release a little too early, it goes in the dirt. If you re release too late, it goes over the catcher's head. When you hit a ball, you know, you're lined up perfectly right at that 45. You can see it every time. Uh, you know, so like I said, I think if people were educated rather than given a bunch of tips, I think the sport would expand because it's not that, that difficult. The, the thing that helped me the most when we started playing together was my knowledge of the 45 degree angle, I will say. So while I said which one's more important, the figure eight and the 45 degree angle, while they do work together, I think that just acknowledging that you need to make contact at the 45. Was, yeah, was I remember, you know, I remember our lessons and I remember one big one on your forehand. I remember the day your forehand changed. I don't know if you do, but I do. And it was the day that I told you, imagine you-, you Painting. You, Painting that, that well, the squeegee. Remember, yeah, remember I because you always wanted to flip the head forward at contact, and I said no, let it drag, let it drag, like you're squeegeeing the inside of 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 a of a car windshield, not the outside, but the inside, and and let your hand lay back right. And I remember that being the big change because you stopped banging the ball and bumping into the ball, and you started really really massaging the ball and 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 hitting the ball from your core because you weren't flipping the wrist around. So I do remember that day as being a big change. Up until then, I could beat you pretty easily. But after that day, 
after that day, I thought to myself, oh, shit, here he goes. Now, now he's got it. And, and you then, felt it. So- and then I started smoking weed and then I really got it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> JB, so let's, uh, let, let's give these people, I guess, a little bit of a summary of what we intend to do in the future with the Real Spin live stream events. I love the fact that we're still in touch and we're now doing a project. Um, a lot of the people that I work with in this, you know, the BrodyTennis.com and the school there, I become very close friends with almost all of them. I, 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 I'm privileged to talk to Dick Gould all the time and Johan and all kinds of people. And, yeah, you know, tennis, these guys that guys, for those of you who don't know what Jack's talking about, tennis guys. Yeah. These are great coaches, you know, uh, award-winning coaches, you know, with Players, huge records. Yeah. And, um, you know, so for me, the real spin is to just keep bringing more interesting people on. And uh, yeah, it's an honor to do this with you. And um, I, I just think the topics are where it's at. I loved our last couple of topics, you know, when we talked about nutrition, when I was out in Hawaii, that was a really fascinating um, show. And when we talked about the grinders, you know, ch- chasing those ATP points, that was fascinating. We talked about the drugs and alcohol. Yeah, I think, you know, co- so many tennis players. Of, yeah, we cover a lot of behind the scenes that people otherwise wouldn't see. You know, they watch break point and they see the guys who are top 10 in the world on court and then slightly off court. But there are no stories that have been told. And I think that's what we address. And I think that's definitely something super valuable we bring and unique to the tennis world. Yeah. And even when we do, uh, you know, the real spin with some superstars, right? We go deeper than just what was your favorite match? You know, I don't really care about that. I I care about what were you thinking at this time? You know, what was it like to be at the top of the mountain and then to crash? What was that like? You know, I mean, how'd you deal with that? Yeah. The game Um, of tennis is super yo-yo. Yeah. So, I, yeah, it's true. It takes it takes big heart and big balls to play tennis. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, yeah, that's what I want to do with uh, with the real spin is just continue to give people the real spin on tennis and say, hey, this is this is what it's really like to grow up tennis. The academies, the tournaments, the backdraw, all that stuff that people really just don't know about. And not all of it's that glamorous. No. There are glamorous parts, but there are a lot of non-glamorous parts. Yeah. Yeah. I I guess the only thing I'd like to say is uh, with the real spin is I just want to keep it lively and I want to keep the humor button on all the time. Yeah. yeah, You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We do do that quite a bit, man. We're not, we're not so serious there. We talk about what needs to talk about, but. There are a lot of references to inappropriate things. Don't you guys worry? You guys tune in <laughs> to the real spin Monday nights at 8 p.m. Except for this Monday night, Jack have a show at New York Comedy Club, Stanford, Ted Jones Comedy Show, which you guys are aware of. Check the link in this YouTube video. And Jack, before we get out of here, why don't you do one of your shameless plugs, buddy? Okay. Uh, well, you know, come to the YouTube channel, Jack Brody or Brody Tennis or both of them and, and subscribe so you can never miss an episode of The Real Spin, go hit up brodytennis.com because uh, that's a really fantastic place. We have uh, a real system of education that is absolutely guaranteed to make a huge impact on your game, transform your game. And uh, and then we have incredible training products that nobody else has. You know, they're just amazing. So go check us out at brodytennis.com and Money, it's always fun talking to you, man. Always great. Jack, I'm happy we got on here. Let the people know what we've been working on. And yep. uh, yeah, guys, stay tuned. We've got super exciting things coming up. The Grand Slam's coming up. We're going to be talking to legends. And Jack, thanks again for bringing me on as a co-host, man. We're going to continue to have a great time, buddy. All right? Thanks, Teddy. All right, Jack. We'll talk soon. All right. All right thanks for See you, man.